everyone. If you've been enjoying the programming that we here at Gaze in Space have been creating for you over these past four years, both in real life and virtually, we'd like to ask you to become a patron of our 501c3 nonprofit organization so that we can keep it all going. If you've enjoyed our original Trek-inspired musical performances presented during our virtual celebrations, not to mention the fabulous Trek-themed drag, or maybe it's the real-life science thing, or maybe it's because you've enjoyed interacting one-on-one -on -one with your favorite Star Trek actors. And if you're like me, you have met some incredible friends that have become your besties, or hey, maybe you met the love of your life out of Gaze in Space again. Or maybe. Simply hearing all of the many diverse voices in our community finally being respected and represented within the Star Trek universe is the reason you want to be a part in making sure these things continue. Whatever your individual reason is for wanting more of what Gaze in Space has created, the way to make it happen is the same. Become a patron and join us in our fight to ensure the continued inclusion of the LGBTQ plus community in Star Trek and in science fiction storytelling. And always remember that to fix the problems of today, we must have hope for tomorrow. Thanks. And you have just crossed the line. End of debate. Report to the cargo bay and remain there until this is over. Is that understood? You use that is a real name and it's a proper name. It's a, it's a person's name in the Ivory Coast, right? Yeah. Which is way better than if someone from the Ivory Coast says, well, you know, Matinga means ashtray. And you're like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, uh, you know. It's kind of in a way it does, unfortunately. Strangely enough. But actually, yeah. if, you, if you Google Matinga, like, I swear to God, like, some lady doctor in Peru comes up. Yeah. Oh, really? Because I've done it. You know, and I have told, I've told my fans on Instagram, dox this lady. Right. <laughs> but I, I look there she. her LinkedIn bio and it says, my friends call me ashtray. And I was like... <laughs> What? <laughs> this is absolute craziness. Garrett, we are so thrilled to have you here on Fire yes. Chicago. Hello, Yay. welcome. Welcome. Listeners slash viewers, we have the very special guest, Garrett Wong of Star Trek Voyager, here with us today. Yay. Right. As Word. well as perennial guest host, Dan Deeby of Gaze in Space. Yay. Yes. Hello. Thank you guys for being here. Absolutely. Now, so we've got Dan, two sci-fi stud muffins on yes. deck. Yes. <laughs> yes. Did you, hey, Dan, did uh, Megan tell you the, the one that she was reading social media and there was a fan that, that was talking about, um, I think he said, uh, Garrett Wong, the verified snack, like that he called me a verified <laughs> snack. Hey. Verified. I love that. No? Yes. Is that wrong? Wait. It was a video. Oh, it was a video. Okay. And? It was all about Voyager. Yeah. Yeah. They got to you, yeah. They said like, not only is he a verified snack, yeah. but blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. So this was a video about all the Voyager characters and this guy was, oh. uh, he was commentating on it, right? And then he goes, and now that we're at, Ver uh, now, and then next on the list of Voyager actors, Garrett Wong. Not only is he a verified snack, but he's also blah, blah, blah. <laughs> wow. That's... I for one don't believe in objectifying performers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Unless Strangely enough, we've all got the munchies, so it yeah. works out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Dan, um, do you know Garrett through Gaze in Space? Is that how this yeah. came about? Well, we um, actually, the first time we met was uh, on the set of Voyager. We did an interview um, actually in Garrett's trailer. You were filming. What episode were you, you were filming the premiere, I want to say, of season four? Yeah. What? When was Scorpion? Uh, probably. I don't know, guys. You That's the end of season three into season four. Correct. Yeah. So, Ooh, yeah, you go, Mike. <laughs> That's right. That's right. right. Because you had uh, your character had just gotten yeah, you had the tentacles and stuff coming out of your nose, and you were filming the oh, premiere. Right. Oh yeah, you were looking tall up. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so Dan, what organization were you uh, interviewing me as then? Uh, for WNYU Radio. Oh, and yeah. I, I don't need, so this was an audio, not a, was it a video? It's just an audio. audio. 
Yeah. I don't even, that's crazy. College radio. Were you, Dan, were you even old enough at that time to, to have done an, how, you must have I been. I mean, were you old enough to be I, on yeah. a television <laughs> I'm, I'm, Oh, I'm never old enough. I've never been old enough. <laughs> Dan, I'm sorry, did you say WNY nude? <laughs> I used to hours. listen to that station. <laughs> Dan, you mentioned WNYU last night when you were talking with Denise Crosby. Yes. Um, during your virtual Gaze in Space event last night. And that's also how you met her. Yep. Okay, yeah. so basically that was your ticket into the Trek universe. Yeah, I completely abused my power as the news director there and said, I am going to interview every Star Trek actor that is willing to speak with me. Like, I'll interview the other actors, do like press junkets for new movies and all that stuff, that's fine. But what I'm really after is getting on the set and interviewing people from Voyager and DS9 and Enterprise and uh, yeah, totally abuse my authority. And now- I, well, You had Mama Nana good. last night also. Yes. It was a great, I want to say the vibe between Denise and Mama Nana is so wonderful. It right. was like hanging out with two people that are actually friends and just listening to them talk. It was really great. They were very gracious and, and friendly. And I got to ask my question about will there be Trekkies 3. And I want to say for the record, a little side tangent, my face was cracked because I submitted that question as a text and I was not camera ready. <laughs> so I was feeling a little bedraggled, but I just went with it. You were a little more Helen ready. Ah, uh, yes, bitch. <laughs> Yeah. Strangely <laughs> enough, Fire Chicote is kind of like hanging out with a group of guys that seem like friends. Right. As well. <laughs> but very backbitey, of course. Mike, of course. Mike, that combination though that Dan had on, if you talk about um if you talk about those two actresses, I would definitely say that Denise Crosby is probably the nicest actress from TNG. Mm. You know, uh, in terms of most personable, most most easily easy eat most um Easiest to get along with, maybe? Right. I don't know, she right? Very most approachable, but, but yeah, yeah. Most, that's, that's the best way to put it. Most down to earth. And then Nana Visitor is also, I would say, probably the most down to earth of the DS9 female uh, wow. actors, I would say, you know? I mean, oh, I, I love Terry yeah. Farrell, you know, uh, and I love uh, all, all the other gals that worked on TNG, but in terms of personable, most down to earth, those two are so down to earth. So that's why I think that chemistry was perfect. And when you see that, you know that's that's what the fans want to see they love mm -hmm. seeing that right because no fan wants some their idol or the, the person that they've been following forever to be standoffish or to not right. you know to act like mm, to put on airs right i mean come on why why do people and that happens a lot that happens a lot the do you know who i am syndrome is what i call right. it you know, mm -hmm. which is horrible but it happens and part of that is because of the industry that we work that we work in um when you're an actor on a tv show or a film, you get catered to by everybody on that mm. set. Like they are bowing down to you, literally. I mean, I just remember here I am, I'm in my, my early 20s, starting out on Voyager, and there's like 60, 64 year old grips, you know, people working on crew coming up, go, Mr. Wong, good morning. I'm like, but that's not, that's not normal. Mm. Like, especially coming from a Chinese culture where it's always respect your elders, right? Never in a million years is the 65 year old supposed to talk to and say good morning to first to a 25 year old or 24 year old. That, that mm. is no, that's a big no, no. Matinga, you're almost 65, pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Listen, it would have worked for me at 22. I would, have, well, yeah. I would have very happily been like, yes, call me Miss Ross. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, there's an old story about Hollywood where someone, some actor storms to a restaurant and says, you know, don't you know who I am? And the major yeah. D is like, I know who you were. Yeah. Like, <laughs> bitch, it's over with. But mm. we didn't want to talk mm. about Faye Dunaway. Wait, you know, speaking, <laughs> of, speaking of, of Nana Visitor and Denise Crosby, uh, it is, I've, I've, from the boards and from watching interviews, uh, it would seem that you were the heart kind of of Voyager. You were the one that brought everyone together. Mm. You were the the guy that sort of like tried to create family. Uh, mm. And I think that that's really lovely. I've seen interviews where uh, Jerry Ryan says just the most lovely things about you. Mm. So I just, I also wanted to point that out that you also have that very same energy. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I always felt that I was the real life uh, morale officer on Voyager. Like I was the Neelix off camera in a way, you know, I was always trying to make sure everyone was getting along and, and nobody was offended about this or that. And I was just trying my best, you know. But you weren't like cosplaying as Neelix, right? Like sneaking into wardrobe. No. Get something. It's all about this. 
because because e- Ethan Phillips was being an officious diva. Yeah, <laughs> that's outfits, what was going on, though. right? Those outfits. But you know, Miss <laughs> Miss. So Garrett, in full disclosure, Miss Booby was saying right before we started that he was nervous that you were going to be here. Really? Well, yeah. The last time I felt that way was when I was going to babysit Mariah Carey's kids. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. It yes, could happen. it could happen. Uh, yeah, I'm not personable. after the court order. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> not after all that stalking, honey. That's true. Okay. I was excited that you were going to be with us. So I'm now. thrilled and pleased. And and Dan, you hooked this up, so thank you and thank you, Garrett, yeah. for being here. This is Fire Chicote. I am Mike Diamond. This is Miss Matinga. This is Booby. And of course, we have very special guests, Dan Devey and Garrett Wong, who played Harry Kim on Voyager. Welcome. Woo-hoo! And today we're going to be talking about a very special episode of Voyager. 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 Voyeur. <laughs> I like that better. Yes. Ooh, that, I Star Trek Voyeur. I like that show. way better. Star Trek Voyeur. I just Boyer. handled Faye Johnny way bitch with that slap. <laughs> no, Mike, Mike, you know how you know how when the porn industry always comes up with titles that are similar to the actual show, that is the <laughs> yes. porn version of Star Trek yes. Voyager. Star Trek Voyager. Yes, yes. yes. Let's copyright that. Let's copyright it, honey. Um, but can we also call it Gape in Space? Or is that... <laughs> I'm so sorry, Dan. I slapped myself silly. Okay, we're talking about a very special episode of Star Trek Voyager. Mm. It is the 100th episode of the series and it is called Timeless. That's right, and Timeless was uh, season five, episode six. It was the 100th episode of Voyager. 100 episodes are uh, celebrated across uh, film and television. Like when you hit that 100 mark, like, you know, that's a very special moment. And- um, Because like syndication, right? Cur- well, syndication, also I think that human beings just like factors of 10, oh. uh, kind of like a nerdy fact, I just think we do. And also um, the, 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 the center and, and, uh, and who holds the center of this episode is Ensign Kim. Garrett, can you give us a synopsis of this episode? Well, let me just let me just start by saying that um, I received a call probably about two months before we filmed this episode from uh, Brandon Braga's office, and uh, Brandon called me up and um, he said, uh, "You need to get ready." And I said, "For?" <laughs> he said, uh, "The hundredth episode. Um, this is our signature Voyager episode. We were going to make this a two-parter. This was going to be a two-parter, but..." We've decided we are going to encapsulate it so that it's just one amazing episode. We want this to be on the level of TOS's City on the Edge of Forever, which a lot of people agree to be the best TOS episode. So they wanted this to be- That's the John Collins episode, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they they wanted this one to be the signature Voyager episode. So he just said, get ready, you know, make sure that you're you're eating right, getting your sleep and everything because you are going to be in everything in this episode. Um, The basic synopsis of this episode is that clearly the ongoing theme throughout Voyager is we are trying to get home. We are trying to find a way back home. 70,000 light years. Literally, if we're traveling at warp 9.99, whatever the fastest that the uh, USS Voyager can travel, this will take 70 years to get home. So at that point, if you can think about it right now, pretty much everyone will be dead. Um, Kim will probably be the only human left alive at 90, whatever he would be right at the time. So um, in this episode, Timeless, uh, they basically figure out a different type of drive uh, called a quantum slipstream drive is what that we've, we've worked out or Kim has worked out. And it's not stable. But Kim suggests, hey, why don't Chakotay and I jump into a shuttle and we go right ahead of Voyager so that we can, we can make calibrations when it starts to get unstable and we can send it back to the main ship and you guys can adjust and we'll make it all the way back to Earth. We'll make it all the way back to the Alpha Quadrant. Um, but unfortunately, uh, of course in order to have an episode, you have to have drama and conflict. So this doesn't work. (laughs) And uh, the ship goes careening out of uh, the quantum slipstream and ends up crashing onto this ice planet and everyone is dead. (laughs) In a gorgeous CGI. I was going to say that. 
great CGI. Yeah. yeah. And the beautiful yeah. CGI of uh, Voyager under the ice as well. Yeah, the reveal the, and the beginning mm -hmm. of the episode, which is a yeah. wonderful reveal if you think about that. Because right. if you're watching as a fan, you know nothing about this and you don't have any spoilers from your friends or anyone that you knew at the time when you first saw this episode, you literally see two people on an icy kind of barren frozen tundra and they're walking around and then one person starts chipping at the ground and p inserting something and and but that reveal of the camera pulling back and then you see so you see voyager frozen under the ice you see the uh, you see the very familiar i think you see the ship des designation the numbers mm -hmm. actually are there mm -hmm. right and it's just it gives you chills you get goosebumps you're like oh my god you it's know? very cinematic mm -hmm. the entire episode yeah. Very cinematic. Yeah. A little yeah. a little thing about this episode, you have OG legend and Star Trek uh, actor LeVar Burton, not only guest star, but direct this episode. What was it like working with him? Well, you know, anytime you work with a director who started as an actor, I think it's easier because they get you more. You know, there are some directors yeah. out there that they're barking orders and commands and, and they're not that great with actors. And, it, and you start to wonder, how did this person even get a career as a director if they can't even speak with actors? But um, LeVar is one of those people who, he's very um, collaborative, is that a word? Can I say that? Yeah, mm -hmm. so he, he really tries to sit there and, and, and works with whatever energy you bring to the set. You know, he'll feel that out. Another person who's really good at that is is my co-host on on the podcast that I do, the Delta Flyers. Robbie McNeil as a director is yeah. phenomenal. I mean, I've never, I've never felt more at ease with a director than when Robbie uh, directed. But you know, how is he? Stuff, top, how hmm? is he? Is he good? Oh yeah, he's is good. He's good. Yeah. He's really good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's I'm good. Good. Tom is Mike's obsession. I'm not, oh. very I'm not obsessed. Really? I'm not stalking yeah. and I'm not really? stalkerish. Yeah. No, darling. You know, sometimes you're watching a program and you connect with a character and you feel like an energy, you know? <laughs> yeah. He's just looking real like tasty, tasty. I mean, but I, but I am not one to objectify performers, okay? Hey, that's right. Yeah, no, not you. I respect him as a human being, and we'll get to that another day. But circling back so, to LeVar Burton, who yes. <laughs> was now the captain of the Starship Challenger, and you get Challenge. a quick, quick view of the Challenger. It was a cool-looking ship. Yeah. Yes. And he doesn't have the visor. He has the... Um, Implants. The eye, the eye implants. The implants, yeah. yeah. Which he had uh, in like the last couple of movies. At any point on set, did Mr. Burton break out into take a look, it's in a I book, know. a real rainbow. <laughs> Just like to calm the crew yeah. down or, no? Because it would no. work on me. It's working on me right now. Well, I okay. heard that, I heard that when no. he was directing, he required that to be sung every yes. time he arrived on set. <laughs> that was the warm up. Bruce was the one, okay, it. everybody, and hit it. I love it. <laughs> That's so funny. On a lighter um, note, I, 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 I think he's in the running to, you could never replace Alex Trebek, but right, to, succeed, Jeopardy. to succeed Alex Trebek uh, mm. in Jeopardy. And I, I think, wow, when I, when I heard that, it would be such a perfect fit. I hope he gets it. We shall see. Well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I felt that that would have been my perfect role, to be honest. So when I saw the stuff there, I was like, mm, yeah, I, I could see him doing that. But <laughs> I, I could see myself doing that better than see he could rocking do that. It. So, I you can know, see you rocking it. Uh, I, yeah, it's just, oh God, hosting is something that I just kind of fell into and I just fell in love with it. I really enjoy doing it. And I tried, like, for instance, when, uh, you know, Dan, you're in New York, when um, Live with Kelly and uh, Michael Strahan, when Michael Strahan left that morning show and they, they were searching and I was sitting there, I tried every possible angle of every connection to try to get in on it, just, just for them to see me once. And I couldn't find any way in. Every agent, every manager I talked to couldn't do anything. But when they announced that he left and they were looking for someone, I literally, I started looking at real estate ads in New York City. That's how confident I felt. I said, I'm going to nail this. I'm going to just, I'm going to nail, I'm going to, I'm going to be the next co-host. I know I will get this. I'm going to get this, you know, and I couldn't even get my foot in the door, which really bumped me oh. out. I mean, I was just like, Oh, if only, and it sucks great. because, you know, if you think about it, when, when it was Regis Philbin and Kathy Lee, mm -hmm. when, when Kathy Lee left, Regis started 
uh, they would, you know, they were looking for all different types of uh, co-hosts and everything and, and A-listers, but who did they find? They found a rel- relatively unknown Kelly soap opera right. actress mm. to be his, you know, so I thought this is perfect. Michael Strahan's out. Now you take someone from the sci-fi world. I'm pretty much in the same zone yeah. as what Kelly yeah. was at at the time, right? I mean, she was a, kind of a, this obscure soap person and not everyone watches soaps, right? Some do, some don't. And then same with sci-fi. Not everyone watches sci-fi. So I kept thinking, this is perfect. But what did they do? They kept looking at every A-lister. They're like, no, we're going to bring in the guy that plays Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. We're going to bring in the guy from, from, um, from New Girl that, uh, that plays What's the character, Megan? Megan. Oh, Jesus. Okay, uh, Schwartz, maybe? I don't know if anyone watches New Girl or not, but, but she yeah, brought yeah, yeah. in all these A-listers. And the funny thing is, nine times out of 10, these A-listers were horrible yep. at live hosting. They were not, because you just because someone works on a sitcom that's a number one sitcom doesn't mean, and I'm talking about, you know, Sheldon, right? I mean, it doesn't right. mean that they're going to be a great host, a live host. That's, that's different. That's it's someone a different has, skill set. To, oh, oh my mo- God, yes. But morning TV, who the hell even watches morning TV? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that. Kelly's got that weird, alarming Stepford wife quality, which would really kind of Honey, unsettle me if I had to work with her every day. That woman's got yeah. high energy. She does. Yeah. Yeah. She does. I mean, it, you know what, Gary? It would have been an exhausting gig. So it, you it would have been. Out. It would have been. But now, yeah. which, if we're talking about about uh, uh, with Alex Trebek's passing, you know, mm. and, it, and really that show, you're going to need a very specific host. Yeah. You're going to need a host that comes off as as a person with intelligence, right? Okay, you can't have you can't have um, LL Cool J host. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. You can't have. Not to say he's an idiot. I'm just saying that you have to have somebody who's right. articulate. Right. You somebody have who does about LL Cool J. <laughs> yeah. This is well, sounding very familiar to me. They, I mean, what? Who was actually better is LL Cool J J. J J. J J. That was great. Kate. Kate did a Kate did a uh, public service announcement with LL Cool J while we were filming Voyager, and <laughs> it was over the weekend. And she came back, and I asked her. I go, "How was it, Kate? How did it go?" Because um, I she said she was doing a PSA. I didn't know who she was doing it with. And she she comes back on the on to to work on Monday morning. We're on the bridge, and and she looks at me and she says, she goes, "Well, it was fine." And I was like, "Who'd you do it with? Uh, who who was the co-star?" She's, well, uh, you know, LL Cool JJ. And I said, LL Cool JJ? <laughs> she added the J on there. Oh, and she was, t- I said, well, how is it working with the rapper? You know, and she said, um, <laughs> well, it was, it was incredibly hot on that set. And it, it was so hot that he kept saying, I'm marinating. I'm marinating. So this is Kate, like, you know, <laughs> impersonating LL Cool J, which was the strangest thing for me to look, to, to, uh, to observe on a Monday morning. Oh, my God. That is hilarious. Mm-hmm. So you had some good times on the set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had some good times on the set. By the way, Mike, I never finished my synopsis. I, oh, I, so oh, yes. The ship crashes the side, uh, into the ice planet, and then 15 years later, a very disgruntled Harry Kim, who is no longer in Starfleet, joins up with his buddy Chakotay, the only two people left alive, right? And with the aid of some Borg technology and some uh, uh, stolen uh, shuttle or whatever we get, you know, we end up, uh, Harry Kim ends up saving the day, so. This is your episode. You are the main focus, Harry's the main focus. You're in almost every scene. Did you feel a lot of pressure when this was was being shot? No, I just kept saying, finally. Right. Yeah. Finally, it, you're, you're, you're using me. Yeah, you're using, yeah. You're using me. Um, yeah. Part of the part of the reason why I, you know, I had some issues with 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 waking up at some point, you know, on the show, and there the rumors were that I was partying, you know, until all nights of the, uh, until all hours of the morning, um, and that was wrong. It was because I was depressed. I was depressed because I felt that I was underutilized. I felt that being a one a series regular on a nine person cast, if you look at TNG six. It, whatever, six or seven, DS9, six Mm -hmm. or seven, whatever. That's the ideal number, six. If you start going above that, now you're just, you're you're, you're not giving each character adequate character development. You just can't, you you just don't have enough episodes to do that unless you filmed 50 episodes, but we don't film 50 episodes a season. Um, So I was depressed as, as all get out, but finally season five, I get an episode that I can really sink my teeth into. You know what I'm saying? Terrific and episode. And you're playing like two versions of Harry. Yeah, that's right. So that's, that's right. that is that was my my way of finally 
showing my acting chops because mm -hmm. up until then, the majority of the times that I tried to add a little extra, you know, zhuzh or a little extra oomph into my performance, I would get a memo, which was, you need to re, you need to reshoot this scene because you put too much emotion into the, your reading. Wow. Of this. Yeah. Wow. And that happened in season one and a little bit of season two where I, I got one, two, three, three or four um, memos to reshoot um, scenes. And I said, okay, I'll toe the line. And this is all because Rick Berman told everybody that uh, all human characters must downplay their roles. Their, their delivery of their lines has to be two-dimensional, militaristic. And in my estimation, when you see that, it just looks like bad acting. <laughs> it doesn't look like good acting. Yeah, it looks very stiff. But he wanted that because he felt this is the only way to make the aliens look realistic. And I was like, are you kidding me? You're telling us to act like Vulcans, but then to make the Vulcans look more realistic? I mean, what are you doing? You know, the, everything that, that he said, I felt was, was just not on the mark, but I didn't want to complain. I was a young actor and trying to make mm. my way. And so I just towed the line, right? So season five to play an older, bitter Kim and bitter. then the younger Kim. Oh, it was just, <laughs> oh, it was a dream. Ooh. It was a dream come true. And I loved it. Yeah. It's interesting yeah. that you say that because the, the thing about the, the cool thing about Starfleet is that, you know, everyone gets along, but everyone mm. getting along isn't conducive to drama, to, to, to mm. good dramatic television. Correct. Correct. And there's an episode earlier in the season where all of us mentioned how good you were in that episode. It's an episode where the doctor wakes up 700 years in the future uh, <laughs> or a copy of the doctor. Yeah. And uh, the, this planet has- Oh, living witness. Yes, they've used yeah. their encounter with Voyager to, uh, 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 and they've totally changed the, the Voyager crew, they kind of turned them into a dark mirror universe of the Voyager yeah. crew. And we were, we were commenting on how, like, how good you were in that episode, because you were oh. cruel, and you were yeah. like beating this, this you prisoner. You were beating that suspect. Yeah. And then you kind of like, you kind of like did your hair in a different <laughs> way, and you were looking all sexy, and we were like, Kim is killing it here. Yes. <laughs> but, you, you, but you had a chance, you had a chance, you were a snack, you were total, to, total snack, but you were, you, but you got a chance to stretch, and that's what an yeah. actor should be given, yeah. they should be given that chance yeah. to yeah. stretch. Yeah, we didn't have a true uh, Mirror Universe episode, but oh, that is the closest to the mirror yeah. universe that we could come to. And I love that episode. I thought it was I just, love it. it was I love so... Eden Janeway. She doesn't yeah. look around. No. Yeah. And her truck driver <laughs> wig and her gloves. <laughs> her yes. truck driver Ooh. wig. God. Everyone, we all we all had the black turtlenecks in that one, isn't that right? And we had, we had the black, black gloves. gloves. On. Yeah. Yes. yeah we were... There was a scene in that, Derek, where you came onto the bridge mm. and to talk to the captain, you like knelt down and went like under the floor. Oh, I went under the, th yeah. You yeah. were like, oh, here's what's happening. And it was just like, wow, he's like right Damn. up in her face yeah. in the weirdest <laughs> way that you could be. <laughs> well, so the, the way that, I yeah. It. I mean, that's a, that's a multi-level bridge, right? So we have the, uh, we have the top level where, where Kim and, and, and uh, Tuvok are, la are, are located. Then you have the center level, which is where, where Chakotay and Janeway is. Then you have the bottom level, which is where Tom Paris is, you know? So because of that, it's a little difficult for blocking wise, you know, and like, how are you gonna, you know, how do we move around this? Especially how does someone from the top level move over to talk to somebody on the center level? So I thought, so I told the director, I was like, why don't, why don't I do this weird thing where I just like, I, I you know, I like, I duck underneath and I come up next to her and he's like let's try it so we mm. did it and it worked well so it adds like, to the weirdness of it all yeah yeah, it kind of yeah. Gives yeah. like a pirate almost like a pirate ship yes it's tuvok and harry on the top and then jacote and janeway and then tom is on the uh, bottom tom's always on the bottom that just screws my whole plan <laughs> up yo <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, Mikey. <laughs> that means the person, that person, that person on the top row yeah. is the last to get their coverage and has the longest day on the set. Generally, I would think. Correct. I would always joke around. I would say that why why couldn't we have filmed this show in Australia? Because you talk about you know you always say that in Australia the toilet you know reverses. Right. So <laughs> instead of doing clockwise, everything is counterclockwise. So um. in in the Western Hemisphere in the United States of America, filming when they did coverage, they would always go clockwise. Janeway first, Chakotay, then down to Paris, then Tuvok, and end with Kim. Always. Wow. Yeah. Every time we filmed on the bridge, it was inevitable that. Um, uh, some AD would come up and say, Garrett, um, yeah, uh, Chicote has a really early call time tomorrow. Can we release him? And we'll just have our script supervisor read his lines. I'm like, sure. Okay. <sighs> and then so he's gone. And then LA, can Janeway, can we release Kate and just, you know, are you mm -hmm. okay? So typically it would be me, 
just me at the end with my close up with the script supervisor reading everybody else's lines with no oh. delineation. It it was yeah. just the same voice. Janeway talking to Kim and then Chakotay and then, and he wouldn't change his voice. So I would have trying to, to use, perform. I'm trying to perform. So I, and that's very difficult because actors always say, "Give me something. Give me something to work off of." But when you have a script supervisor reading for you, unless they're really good with voices, unless your script su supervisor is a master of a thousand voices, you're not going to, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get rich little sitting there uh, you know, <laughs> doing your script supervision. So I was just, oh, I, I was really, I was frustrated with that. That was really uh, frustrating. Did they never and I remember to break into a Captain Janeway for you ever? No. Like Harry, what's the temporal variance? No. <laughs> no. I should have, you know what I should have did? I should have just recorded, pre-recorded. Yeah. Jane, I should have did all the lines for Janeway, right? All that stuff. And then just handed them that cassette tape or whatever, that DVD and say, here, just roll the, just play this. Play and, I, and, I, and then I could hear myself doing Janeway, how myself <laughs> doing Chakotay's voice, myself doing all their voices. Um, but oh, you did Mike, Kate earlier, you did her pretty well. The thing with Kate is, uh, it's like her voice changes throughout Voyager. There is one point, I think it's either season four or five, her voice sounds like an angel because Ooh. that was the year she stopped smoking. Oh, she, wow. and so while wow. she wasn't, you know, she wasn't chain smoking. So her voice... It, it went from, which proves the human body always tries to heal itself. You know what yeah, I'm saying? If yeah. like, when you have damage from that old woman smoker voice, you know, and that's why her voice sounds like the way it did in the beginning. Did you just yeah. say she had old woman smoker voice? It, no, she, she was, she was on the way to that. You know right, what I'm saying? Okay. Because this to me is old woman smoker voice right here. Oh it's real. God. And this is not that's how the, Jane Weiss talked. She didn't talk like this. That's but, the best Kathleen Turner I've heard. In <laughs> <years>. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, Did you see me great. do Romancing the Stone? I was oh. really good back in the day. <laughs> so her, that was the journey that she was on, right? Her voice was going towards the heavy, hard yeah. smoker voice, but it wasn't totally there. So if you start like this and start going like this, then slowly you become Janeway. So this is how you right. find Janeway is begin with the really gravelly and then pull it up into a little bit more. Right. And yes. that's how you find it. But she <laughs> sounded great for that one season. She stopped smoking and then something stressed her out, you know, with her And then season six, right. she picked up that crack pipe and things just went all up. sideways. Yeah. Hi. Oh. Uh, I, I thought a nice uh, and uh, or an interesting point in the episode was you were able to reinitialize the doctor, and so then Robert Ricardo becomes part and parcel of this mission as well. And uh, what what was it like working with Picardo? He's such an interesting character actor. He's like a journeyman actor. Uh, yeah. And uh, I happen to have loved him. He literally like made me frightened of werewolves like for the rest of my life. Yeah. From the howling. Oh, like, from he the howling. Play, he yeah. plays such a crazy character in the howling, yeah. Yeah. and then you see him as the doctor, as this kind of like this effete you mm -hmm. know, sort of kind guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, he just seems like the most interesting guy. What was it like to work with him? Um, you're right in that he has definitely had his share of memorable roles throughout, yeah. uh, throughout his, you know, history as an actor. Um, and yeah, uh, when he was the werewolf, uh, it's scary as heck. When he was uh, Johnny Cab number five, whatever in, uh, what was the uh, Total Recall, oh, right? Total. You know, it's like, oh my God, inner space. Do uh, you guys remember the movie where he, he was, um, oh my gosh, it was, uh, it was a mo Lover Boy? It was about uh, Patrick Dempsey was a pizza delivery guy and he had to like, uh, he had to oh. end up being like a gigolo to these really rich older women. Um, and then one of the movie. women he sleeps with ends up being like, I think it was Bob Picardo's wife or something like that and he played like a i think he was a doctor in that one a surgeon or something like that but that movie um again everything that he takes on he puts his stamp on you know and yeah. same thing with the doctor he did really well if you're talking about a breakout character on the show he would definitely fall into that you know category yeah. um and the doctor kind of gags <clears throat> yeah he got a lot of comedic moments you know, yeah. almost entirely all the comedy came from the doctor at one point, a little yep. bit from Neelix, but mostly the doctor, which I had issues with because I kept saying, um, why are you not utilizing the strengths of all of us? Because all of us have a great sense of humor. I mean, I, I think 
Kate Mulgrew is hilarious. Bob, uh, Robert Picardo, Robert McNeil is one of the funniest people on the planet. But you don't see that humor coming from these human characters. Mm. You see it coming from the doctor. And uh, one of the things that would, you know, that continues to happen to me at every convention I go to, people will come up to my table and get an autograph and they'll say, I love Voyager. I like Kim a lot. Kim's great. But my favorite character is the doctor because he's so funny. Aww. And when they say he's so funny, if they say my favorite, favorite character is the doctor and end with that, I'm okay. But when they throw he's so funny, that makes me, that I, I'm like, oh, we're all funny. We just weren't <laughs> given the chance to show it. You know, you really, really missed out on this. So I really think that if I ever become a showrunner, I'm going to look at what are the strengths of the actors that I have. How can I incorporate those strengths into this show? You know what I'm saying? And you that's, can also just cast part. Ricardo and just give him no funny lines whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, very belated revenge. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, like, they- I'm going to be like, Mike, that's perfect. I'm going to say, Bob, I've, I've, I'm, I'm a showrunner in this new show and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and cast you. You don't even have to audition. And he'll be like, really? What have you cast me in? And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> Bob, you're playing the part of the mute. <laughs> You're also, wait a minute, so I can't speak. Uh, not only that, you're also blind and you can't, you know, I mean, you completely, <laughs> you have no limbs either. You can't walk, you can't talk, you can't, you're just a torso in this episode, uh, in this in this show that I've planned. So, thank you, Mike. He, thank and then you. somehow he still yeah. wins the Emmy and yeah, you're like, oh. <laughs> and accepting the Emmy for best nonverbal <laughs> actor, Robert Ricardo. Hello, thank you so much. I want to thank Garrett for giving me this Emmy. If without him casting me as the mute with no arms and legs, I would never have won this Emmy. Thank you. So yeah. that is uncanny. Yeah, yeah that's I'm a good you. Picardo. My God, that's <laughs> uncanny. It's very, it's very much the Doctor. It's, yeah. It sounds like the Doctor. I do love when he refers to Harry and Chakotay as Bonnie and Clyde. I did, in this episode, I did laugh. Yeah. I, I did find that funny. So yeah. I want to circle back to the ice planet for a second. What I yeah. thought was really interesting in the beginning was, you know, we don't know who these two characters are stomping right. across this ice planet. Their outfits seem very lightweight. So I'm, is it like a future space technology yeah. where they have this lightweight mylar looking i was like how are they not freezing yeah i felt the same thing i thought god this stuff looks so flimsy you know Mm. i mean i don't think that this would really but then i as an actor i said no this is the most advanced starfleet technology it's like it's tissue paper but it has super thermal thermal properties right that's they basically had you like in reynolds wrap yeah i'm like I totally thought the jacket was kind of cute. I would have rocked it at the club with like a little rainbow tube top yeah. and like some, some cooch cutters. Yeah. And just right. that jacket like kind it of was thrown stylish. off the shoulders. Yeah. Very stylish. Yeah. That could be a go-go go dancer right. outfit. For sure. yeah. yeah. And yeah. I will say that they aged you up very well. And also uh, Robert Beltran as Chakotay. You know, you still look like Harry, but yeah. clearly time has gone by. You yeah. are not happy with whatever situation is happening with you. Jacote's giving me like a white shock in the front of his hair. Like, who's the evil bitch from Josie and the Pussycats? Her. Veronica. Whatever her name is, but giving me like, I, like I sexy silver daddy, Jacote. <laughs> and so as the two remaining members of the Voyager crew. Oh, yeah. and chakotay has got a side piece. That's right. Chris, Chris, uh, Christine uh, uh, Harnos, I Harnos. believe, yeah. is she plays Tessa, and in her few scenes, I thought she had a really nice impact. Yeah, uh, she's I thought, good. Like, she's good. Yeah, I thought she was really good. Yeah, and her Super eyebrow nice. game is on point. She is giving you like late nineties eyebrow. Yeah. Ooh, honey, maybe it's Maybelline. I- I gotta try to find her on Facebook and say hi to her now that you reminded me of Christine Harno. Super nice gal. What was the one thing I remember that was a little peculiar was one day she's she was talking about, oh, my boyfriend's gonna be here next tomorrow or something. He's gonna come by to set. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And um, the next day, you know, she was like, oh, my boyfriend's here. You should come meet him. He's in the tra- he's in my trailer. I'm like, okay. So I came over and as I she opens the door and she introduces me to her boyfriend. And honestly, just imagine any image that you have of traditional Santa Claus. Oh, ah. the hair was white. That's all that, that 
shows his age already. And it was yeah. again, long, the same length as Santa Claus, the beard is like, like literally I thought this is candid camera. <laughs> gonna be, oh, Alan Funt is going to walk out and say, ha ha, this is not her boyfriend. This gotcha. is Santa Claus. You know, <laughs> like, you know what? Yeah, That's so hot. Young woman. But, it, but it impressed me because it was like, you know what? She's not some Hollywood ingenue, like with this, this side piece guy, boyfriend that ends up being some GQ model guy. It was like, this was, she was literally dating Santa Claus. And it was like, this is really kind of different. And, di you know, I remember Or that maybe scene. he was a very successful banker. We don't know. You know, I'm not casting aspersions or whatever. Or maybe he was just really warm on cold winter nights. Oh, when it was California. Oh, yeah. I love the scene that you have with the doctor where it doesn't go right the first time and you lose it. Lose and, it. And you lose it. And the doctor's yeah. trying to <clears throat> rein you back. And it was, I thought it was a tour de force. Like I was so shook for Harry uh, mm. in that moment. That, yeah, that actual scene was on a scale from one to 10, 10 being, you know, you nailed it. One mm. being the worst, can't act your way out of a paper bag. Um, I would say that that performance was like a seven, but I gave a nine point nine performance that somebody messed up because they dropped like a like a, a wrench in the background or and against the ladder and it just screwed the whole thing up and I was just like no, like and I just remember the look, the look. Well, the look on Lavar's face when that happened because you could you. I could tell he knew that I was nailing it. Like he was, and then he was like, oh. He's like, take a look. It's in a book. <laughs> Is there a take where Picardo hauls off and slaps you? No. Like, you know, like they always do that on shows, like get a grip and then they get slap them. That, that's my airplane moment. In the, okay. in the yeah. airplane, the movie the where they, they yeah, people. they're like, <laughs> they have that line of people ready to slap that with the nuns, were they nuns that they were getting <laughs> yeah. kicked? Oh, yes. Somebody had a gun. Oh, it's hilarious. <laughs> Someone's holding like noon chucks. They're all yes. waiting. <laughs> so Harry's feeling the brunt of the guilt because it was his idea to go on the shuttle and he was responsible for sending back the phase variants yeah, yeah. to Voyager to make sure that the slipstream, this is the part that confuses me, I'm not a techno queen, that the slipstream goes okay, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But then, oops, Voyager crash lands on Hoth, but Chakotay and Harry get back to Earth. And I wonder, does Harry try to hook up with Libby? You remember Libby? Yeah, yeah it's with the brows again. I did again. think that. I was like, does Harry get it with Libby again? Where's Libby? Yeah, what happened to Libby? Where's Libby? As you know, anyway. I don't uh, know. Libby who had the opposite eyebrows of Tessa, because yeah. Libby was giving you full caterpillar glamour. Yeah. And Tessa's giving you nice. But anyway, so Did, did you guys, I have a question, guys. What did you think of Harry's hair as the bitter disgruntled 15 years older hair well <laughs> i have something to say <laughs> yeah okay I, I thought i thought harry because we discussed it right before the show i thought oh. you i thought like you looked really august and handsome and maybe just a little touch of prosthetic it was subtle i thought you i thought it was really really nice mm. but that wig looked dry <laughs> <laughs> that, that wig looked so dry i wasn't happy with it I was, I, was like, let's, I, was, I was like, let's ask Garrett about his process. And by process, I mean that dry wig. Oui. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I wasn't happy about it. Because like they, they gave me test wigs before this, right? They were testing different wigs. And the one I liked the most, <laughs> literally, it was like down to the middle of my back. It was like this Ooh. super long hair. And I said, I said, I like this. This looks mm. great. And, mm -hmm. then, um, and then I told this to, the, to, to I think, to Brandon, the, the writer and executive producer. I said, listen, I think this is the way to go. He's like, mm, Harry hasn't been living in a cave this entire time, so no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I like, look like this cave-dwelling hermit, you know, but it was super <laughs> cool. Super cool. It's oh. like Harry joined a hair band. Long, yeah. Right. Came long all the way, right? Not like a mullet. Long. No, it was a mullet. It was long everywhere. Like oh, and then there's this, there's a picture, there's a Polaroid shot of me standing between the, the hair and makeup trailer with this wig on and it's windy. So it's blowing in the wind. It's just, it, <laughs> looks, it looks amazing. It was oh, like, nice. oh. We're going to call is... you Miss Ross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it maybe, it was more, maybe it was more, come on, feel the noise. Uh, oh. No, it was more Miss Ross, I think, than, <laughs> than come on, feel the noise. I want to go with that. Well, they made a choice with that wig. 
They made they it. Did. Yeah. Maybe maybe it's harder to age someone up 15 years when they're already young, you know. So um, I'm not sure how yeah. old Chakotay was supposed to be, but they didn't have yeah. to age him up as much. You yeah. know, because Harry was going from very young to yeah. older, but not old, but bitter. Right. Yeah. Bitter. Yeah. So, so it, all this time he's been running around trying to get Voyager rescued or, yes. or found, actually. Right. right. Exactly. I mean, Harry clearly did not quit Starfleet right, right when he got back, but mm -hmm. you know, his insistence upon trying to convince the, the Starfleet brass that they need to uh, do, you know, somehow save the crew, you know, they got, it just, it got so frustrating that he finally quit because nobody was listening to him. So, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. And again, that, that hair, when they put that wig on me, I was looking around going, okay, so where's the real wig I'm going to be wearing today? I mean, I, I, this is, this can't be it. There's no way this is what you want me to wear. But they were like, no, this is it. I'm like, no. I, I actually think it, it was the right wig. It, just like okay. a little, like maybe like an Alberto Vito 5 hot oil treatment. Just, right, right. Some conditioner. Just cause it needed some body. Like. Just some type of yeah, you're right. You're yeah. right. It looked she like straw. It was she straw. was crunchy. But it's maybe crunchy. It's because you know, like Harry's so obsessed that he doesn't have time to moisturize his hair. Right, <laughs> right. Hair. I don't have time for leaving condition of it. He's on a I'm mission. To find my people. But then just give him dreadlocks. Then you know, just yeah. he doesn't have time. Like, Harry's got dreads. I, I do have. I do have a question. You know, the crew of Voyager playing fast and loose with the temporal prime directive. Mm -hmm. Not just on this episode. On yeah. multiple episodes. Oh yeah, no. Do you think? Do you think that Harry, you know, thought about it, or he was like, "I'm doing this." I don't. It think probably he took him time to get there. I don't think he cared at all. No, he only wanted his friends back. He wanted his crew back. That's it's it. a beautiful moment between you and Lavar when you're talking to Captain Jordy LaForge, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know, uh, or, or actually perhaps it's it's Chicote that's talking to uh, uh, Captain LaForge, but uh, LaForge says to him, you know, I have to try and stop you, but I understand. I would probably be mm -hmm. doing the same. And thing. he and Jordy would do the same, and I was like, yeah, like that's great. Had, I thought it was beautiful. Mm. I thought I, it was kind of in a way he was saying, you're going to try and I'm going to try and stop you. Mm -hmm. But I know you're going to try. And I thought that I thought that was like a beautiful Star Trek moment. Very mm. much so. Yeah, very much so. And then back to back to LeVar Burton. Um, another cool thing that he helped me with was I, you know, I had such a such a hard time with those lights, um, those set lights being so hot. And I was always just perspiring, just sweating like crazy. And I remember when he noticed that and he's, he went and had somebody in wardrobe grab me like a towel, like a wet towel. And he was like, okay, I'm going to put this around the back of your neck and drape it over in front. So he was doing these things to help me combat my excessive sweating. And um, later I found out that every Star Trek has one excessive sweater of in their cast wow <laughs> and then so wardrobe tells me this they're like you're the <laughs> you're the winner for voyager you're the you're the biggest sweater on this of this cast okay and then i said really what about the other shows i said what about tio i said what about tng they said lavar burton i go oh, oh. I said, what about enterprise they go flocks i said oh okay so it's like every show has one person who just can't stop sweating and for me it was so bad. They had to make a, a, a very special, um, like the under shirt that we have, that sort of like tur that mock turtleneck. Okay. Everyone has that as a shirt. I have it as a wrestler's Olympic wrestler garment thing. So it's, it's, a singlet? Into, yes, that's, that's oh, what it was. Do they give one to Tom? Me. Does Tom have one too? I'm sorry. He didn't. <laughs> 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 no, he had no singlet, but I had that. But but underneath the underarm, they had attached these little um, connectors like buttons, and they just they literally took they built a very thick pad, like almost like a it's like a tampon basically to absorb the you know liquid, and they would stick it oh, underneath, wow. attach it by buttons underneath each underarm. So that would How much what happened? Was, oh, it was crazy. Like they would because remember what is our suit. What is our what is our Starfleet uniform look like? The top is colored, but everything else is black. black okay? right. So now, Absorbent. when the sweat went through, 
and it started to dry, you saw this white like oh, line wow. of, of salt sweat that would cu- cut across and it would look just like, you know, Charlie Brown's shirt, but it would be like a <laughs> in that pattern. Like it just goes up and down. And you, they, you could they, sell that on eBay, right? I, Somebody no, will like, buy that. Yeah, well, it was, it was difficult because wardrobe had such a hard time just getting that salt stain off all the time. They wow. said, okay, we got we to figure out how to keep this sweat from getting out from underneath your, your mm. arm, armpits. Mm. And they said, we're going to make this special uh, you know, addition to your, um, your wardrobe that's going to stop this. And it did. It worked. I mean, it was- And a- sweating up under that wig in this episode probably added to- <laughs> yeah. The wig, yeah. the lights. Mm. Yeah. Maybe so, that's yeah. why the uh, winter jacket was just Reynolds wrap. They were like, right. "We're not going to make this sweat anymore." Like, yeah. They're like, "Are you kidding? This kid's going to be dead if we put this on him." Yeah. Right. <laughs> what were the uniforms made out of? Was it was it wool? Was it cotton? Um, it was a wool blend. It was so a wool that's blend. That, that's... So they were hot. Yeah. So it was like wool, polyester, you know, and it was not, it was not breathable at all. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, it was the worst. <laughs> it was probably the worst of, uh, wardrobe that I've ever had to wear in any project. Wow. Yeah. Also mm. in a one piece jumpsuit, like, like you can't gain weight. Like no one can be fat in Starfleet. Yeah. Like you right. got to stay trim. That's right. Yeah. So what happened is um, at one point, the three of the actors started to, change their dimensions of their midsections uh, from eating too much junk food. <laughs> and then uh, they started sending girdles to their trailers to wear. So, wow. and that would be myself and uh, Robbie McNeil. And oh. I'm so sorry. Yes. <laughs> he, he went, yeah, he went overboard. He, yeah. he probably had the most weight gain of all of us. And then, wow. um, and Chicote as well. So the three of us um, were given these girdles that we were supposed to put on to, to suck it, to push our midsections down. Um, uh, Bob Accardo kept working out the whole time. He never got heavy, which is, you know, good for him. Um, and the same thing with Tim Rusk. He kept his, his felt figure the entire time, but um, Chicote, Kim and Paris were, were so portly at one point and we, you know, they wrote it into an episode, um, the, the demon planet episode, uh, which uh, you guys know what season that is. I don't even, uh, season uh, it's towards the end of season four, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yes. So yes. That was that's the time. where you get the, the, that's where you get the biomimetic episode that happens a little bit later. Yes. Yes. So Such that, a great episode. Right. But yeah. couldn't they just redesign the outfits? Because remember when uh, Roxanne Dawson was pregnant and they give her that, that sort of like A-line. <laughs> yeah. And she would just be behind, behind no. a council all the time. Yeah. yeah. Just like, you know, a no. big pad. No, you know, find solutions. Get, yeah, I know, but they wrote. But in that Demon Planet episode, they wrote it into the, the into the lines the, the in, about our weight gain because they really? they're so passive aggressive. Those writers, they literally, if they were upset with us about anything, they wouldn't tell us. They wouldn't call us. They would just write it into the lines. So in that episode, if you watch that episode, that that stuff, that silvery liquid in that pool gets right. in, in suit, and it and then you hear you know you hear Major Barrett's voice, life support is compromised you have blah 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 this amount of time before you 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 lose oxygen right so now i'm struggling so then paris is trying to help me back to the shuttle but that little piece of silvery mercury leaves my suit and goes into his and now it's like eh, 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 life support compromise so we're both kind of struggling back to the shuttle and the lines literally paris goes um Ari, promise me one thing if we make it back alive i'm like yeah What's that? What's that, Dom? Promise me you'll work out. That's the line that they wrote <sighs> into the so script. So passive aggressive. That is so, so shady. shady. So shady. Mm-hmm. So shady. Mm-hmm. That's writer shade, right? That's, that's wow. Cool. I, so I called up Brandon and I said, I said, man, that's not cool. And he said, he said, he said to me, he literally said, well. If you and your compatriots continue eating garbage <laughs> and, and candy, for, you know, whatever you're eating in between takes at the craft service table. And they didn't help. They put that stuff out there. They didn't like give us a, a, a lot of healthy alter- alternatives, to be perfectly honest. It was always Kit Kat bars and Snickers bars and Ooh. all kinds of just junk, you know, muffins, you know, just full of sugar and preservatives. And so, um, so Brandon says, uh, if you continue the way that you've been eating with your compatriots, we might have to change the name of the show. 
to Star Trek Voyager, Pigs in Space. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, shade. Yeah, so I was, oh, my God. Man, that is the ultimate shade right there. It's <laughs> like, you know, and I, I said, I, said I, I hear you. I hear you. I need to lose the weight. And I did. I went, I went to the gym. I did cardio. I cardioed my ass off. Literally. It was just like every day, just getting on the bike or elliptical, whatever it was. Yeah. And I knocked it all off. I knocked but it all off. That has and to I, be Hollywood standards. Cause I don't really remember thinking, Oh my God, they put on so much weight about any, any hey, of I, you guys. I never noticed. I never, really? and, and by the way, I'm wearing Spanx right now. <laughs> just for I, fun <laughs> i do remember that there is by the time i had lost all the weight they were still airing episodes where i was heavier right and i remember being out in public and somebody saw me and they're like wow like that how much weight did you lose oh this week God. and i was like no it wasn't this week man you're why you've been watching <laughs> older episodes this is like gradual you can't lose that much that quickly but in this episode you're looking quite fit and trim mm, yes it's yes. chakotay as is Tessa, or whatever that character's name is. Yes. Uh, what is the plan that you guys come up with to undo the damage to Voyager? There's some plan about changing the phase variance. Oh, and I just want to say the shot of Captain Janeway dead on the bridge. How many times does Janeway die in this series? I don't know. Dead, covered in ice, seven, dead, covered in snow. It was. Paris. Pretty gruesome. Yeah. yeah. Gasping. Yeah. She was posed beautifully, though. I yeah. Mean, yeah. See, that's the a thing. Yeah. Heroic kind of, you know, but also very Janeway, very dramatic. Like, the like with a coffee. <laughs> She should have had a coffee die. mug. She should have yeah. been holding a coffee mug in her hand while she's <laughs> and, and, and for some and, and, a, and a plate of pecan pie. Yeah. Pecan pecan pie. Pie. It's so yeah. weird. Yeah, it is odd. They were they were they were definitely displayed in, in a beauty glamour death pose as all yes. of them, In right? a way, it looked like they were sprayed with that stuff you used to spray on Christmas trees, like the fake snow. I, yeah. I think that's what they did. I think that's what they did. I mean, don't breathe. Yeah. Honey, don't breathe. Yeah. Um, but the episode does jump back and forth between the present, present yeah. day or future yeah. Harry and Chakotay yeah. and a present day Voyager yeah. about to go into the slipstream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, and there's a great scene where they're celebrating the new engine. Yeah. And there's and it's in slow motion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and seven but is if you, drunk, and it's awesome. Oh, oh it's yes. fabulous! I, I, many times I refer to the title of this episode n- not as timeless, but seamless. And when I say seamless, I'm referring to the transitions between the two times, between 15 yeah. years in the future mm. and you know current time. And it's really those transitions were done so well. Like mm. when you see that one that one pad, and, it, and then you see it in real life. And the only other time that I felt that in any other thing that I've watched was the original um, Highlander. The original Highlander movie and switching between old Scotland and then current day New York City. Amazing. Like everything mm. they did, it was just so cool, you know. And then that's kind of how I felt with Timeless. It was seamless in that trend. Yes. You also had those shots of the Delta Flyer followed by Voyager, and then it would be the Delta Flyer followed by uh LaForge's ship, the yes. Challenger. See? And yeah. that, it was so beautiful. So good. Yeah. Because the Delta Flyer stays the same. It's the ship that's following that's different, and you immediately know, okay, now I'm yeah. 15 years ahead. Yeah. I thought that was so well done. Yeah. Well, they clearly poured resources into this episode. I mean, aside from yeah. Garrett's wig, they clearly <laughs> you know, they poured resources <laughs> into it. And I do like the scene with Chakotay and Janeway where she has him over for dinner because they're celebrating what's supposed to be their last night in the Delta Quadrant. Yes, yes. And... I, I mean, I found it funny, but I was also like, is she cooking or is this replicator cooking? There were, ju- I was like, what's going on? It's replicator cooking. Yeah. yeah. And also the meal that she prepares, I'm sorry, did she make him something called my grandmother's vegetable punani? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to re-listen. Don't so try that. I was, like, I was like, Kathy, mama. <laughs> I programmed a dish my grandmother used to make back on Earth. Vegetable biryani. I think it was vegetable biryani, which I actually love. Oh, oh. I gotta listen yeah. to it again. But strangely, Janeway's cooking Indian? Like that, I thought was an interesting point. Maybe her grandmother was Indian. We don't know. 
Yeah. You know, you know the thought I just came up with, guys. The fact that we have replicators, nobody really has to cook in in the you know, and so that to me, I start thinking schools like Le Cordon Bleu would never ex- they'd be dead. They'd be, right. There'd be nobody going to become a chef, right? Everything is just replicator. It's just done. And how do you burn something in a replicator? You can. Why is Neelix on board? <laughs> why yeah, is Neelix on board? Yeah, and Neelix, Neelix is cooking, always mm. trying to feed you that so that that unholy Leola root. Yes. He needs to go on. Yes. No, not so, my Neelix. I know you love Neelix. So they come up with a plan to, in a gruesome scene, they take Seven's body. Yes. <laughs> so the doctor has her on ice. Well, she's been on ice, but yeah. um, she's relatively fresh. So they're going to extract her Borg implant transmitter nano receiver thing her yeah. interplexing her beacon interplexing beacon her, of yeah. course that's what i meant her interplexing beacon yes <laughs> and they're going to figure out the exact phase variance or something and yeah. send a message to the past but there's a scene with a doctor holding her fucking face her head yeah. her head yeah. With her eyeball, and I was like, oh my. Alas, poor Yorick. Yeah, it was oh. very, uh, yeah. <laughs> very, very shades of that. Yeah. Yeah, but then I was like, you know, the doctor, he's a doctor, I guess, you know. Right. Then again, he's holding her head. Yeah. 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 But oh, he's also he... trying to, they're, they're all trying to save the crew. Right. Yes. And the plan is yeah. to find a frequency and send a message to seven in the right. past because the Borg had a temporal like texting system. Chroma, chroma, chroma something. Cro- a telechromatic Snapchat thing, right, yes. Right, right. Okay, yeah, bring it. So where are we at in the story? What's happening? Well, well there's a, I, I have to ask, Garrett, there's the scene when uh, Chakotay is talking to the doctor and Chakotay has to ask the doctor to determine her precise, and it was massive techno value. And we all know that Beltran is not the best at nailing the techno babble. <laughs> and when you watch the tape, you can see he is taking his time. Yeah. And he is fully pronouncing each word. Yeah. And I swear by the end of the scene, I was like, he got through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you access Seven's chronometric node and pinpoint the exact moment her cybernetic implants disengage from her organic systems? Yeah, Yeah, I almost feel like because of our friendship, I think he probably, you know, he prepared himself a little bit better, you know, where he said, like, I'm not going to mess up for Gary. I'm going to keep I'm going to keep this going because that can be very distracting if, if another actor just can't cannot say something it's something is a tongue twister or whatever and they just do take after take after take and that really saps the energy of everyone else in the scene because you know you're sitting here you're ready you're ready to go you're giving it your 110 percent and then another actor in the scene screws up one word you're like oh he goes do it again (laughs) and that could really end up being very detrimental to the final product so uh, interestingly chakote seems kind of mellow in the episode especially played against harry whose emotions are so Heightened. Angry. Yeah. Why won't it fuck? They trusted me and I killed them! Mr. Kim! Chakotay's uh, maybe almost too chill. Like when he's saying goodbye to Eyebrow Lady, and mm-hmm. you know, he's like, you know, if this works, I'll never see you again. And she's like, oh, maybe I'll see you. If all goes as planned, we'll have changed history. The past 15 years erased. I mean, Mike, do you think that he could have been more emotional? over that you, you, do you think that would that have worked you know because I, it, it made me question how much he really cared about eyebrow lady um, because like okay. if you've established a life with someone like if someone yeah. said you know let's pretend that i had a social life or any kind of skill in that regard which i don't right and i fell in love with someone which i never will and someone said that person's going to disappear but you could be with your your og bitches yeah if i really love the person that i'm with yeah mm, i don't know I don't yeah. know. It's it's interesting. This, yeah. this is why the time travel episodes always do a number on my head. Right. You and know? we don't know the true backstory of this. Who knows? Maybe their relationship sucked. You know, maybe they were right. arguing all the time. And maybe he was thinking, this is my way out. This right. is perfect. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> To me, he's t- he just seems kind of resigned and restrained. Like it yeah. seems like it seems like 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 Ensign Kim is is just 
you know, he's suffering PST, P- P- PTSD. Mm-hmm. He's really damaged by this. And yeah, he, raw. Needs, yeah. he needs to rectify this. He's just a raw nerve. Yes. And that- Because um, he Chakotay, feels responsible. Yeah. 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 And Chakotay is not like, is is there to help and he's resigned to what's going to happen. Yeah. But like, you know, he's also, he was the second in command. So he was probably used to kind of holding those things down in a situation. And, mm-hmm. and, and you know, this is the plan. We're going to follow through. I feel like he loved her. I really yeah. do. I agree. And I agree. I mean, think I about it. Chipotle was getting laid. There is no way Harry yeah. was getting laid. <laughs> yeah, before. yeah, that's yeah. right. So he he had the benefit yeah. of he was he was getting a lot of his tension out from having <laughs> uh, sex. So and, uh, and I, I just regardless yeah. of which way it went, he was good. Like we succeed, great. <laughs> I my crew. We oh, don't well. succeed. I continue to have sex with this beautiful lady. <laughs> yeah. I tried. Right. Oh well. Gave it a good shot. Yeah. yeah. Let's yeah, let's I go know. to Ryza now. Yeah, Mike, when I watched that episode, I never think like, well, it doesn't seem like he cares so much about her. Mm. I kept thinking he's very, he's accepted his fate. He's accepted what's going to happen, what's yeah. going to be destiny. He's just very zen about it. You know, I just felt like he's, he's lived his life. He's seen things. He's done things. He's good. You know, mm. one way or the other, he's good. And I didn't ever feel that he was uncaring. Okuchimoya. Yeah, Okuchimoya. <laughs> yeah, also, even, even in the, that dinner scene when, when Kathy's serving him that obscene Indian dish, and he's still questioning the validity of going forward with it, mm. even though there was a problem with the engine, he yeah. accepts her decision. Yeah. You know, he states his... Always. Always, but he states she, his, No, she says, she says something, are you with me? And he's like, always. Right. Yeah. yeah. I want to start an a, a Voyager cast ASMR channel. Where um, it's just it's Chicote going, Akuchi Moya, Akuchi <laughs> and then Jane Way going. There's coffee in that nebula. There's coffee in that nebula. Like that. Like all of them will say their their one. You know, the Neelix would be like Leola Root. Leola Root. <laughs> coffee. That's brilliant. Wow. You know how many people would actually watch that? I'm thinking that would be <laughs> funny. Oh, oh. <laughs> You're about to make some bank, honey. Stick okay, Mike. Yeah. Well, yeah, I want to ask Mike, what would what would Robbie make, what would Tom Paris's ASMR line be then? I want to have sex with Mike Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just you know off the top of my head here. Right, right. <laughs> I'm okay. sorry. No, it would actually be yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am, Pam. Yes, ma'am. Love it. And then you, and then you could mix it up. You could be like a coochie moya, de la hoya. <laughs> Just for a little, you know. Yeah. Mike, what is it about Tom Paris that attracts you to him? I mean, is it his his attitude, or is it something about his physical looks? Uh, well, his, his ears you know, is it what he's kind of like on the ginger spectrum which i do think is very cute yeah um also you know he's a bad boy he's a rebel he don't play around okay he's a pilot okay he's, he's a bit of a gangster but you know he a lover okay. i mean that's what i've thought about it right uh, no yes. no of course not i don't know he just he gets my spark plug going i don't know <laughs> do you know that for the first three or four years of voyager like everyone would do their little shtick like my would do you know voice funny voices and accents and on the bridge during rehearsal and tom paris robbie mcneil would always do his gay voice is what he would do oh lord and, and it yes. was he i'm i have to tell you it would like for instance there uh, he was wearing a sweatshirt that said gap it was gap athletic and and the way he was sitting, the P was kind of, it, it was distorted, so it did look like gay athletic. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, Robbie, did, where did you get that gay athletic sweatshirt? And he was like, this whole thing. And he started doing this. <laughs> this I mean, it was so. But Mike, uh, to, to all of you, it was so authentically. On point. Um, oh my god, it was on point. <laughs> so on point, and just everything, everything, every mannerism, every every cadence. It was so good that uh-huh. season four, it disappeared. So yeah. I was like, dude, I asked him, Mike, I said, why? Where did your go-to voice go to? Where did your go-to like, character? And he said, he goes, Carol made me stop 
doing. Carol? What his oh. wife at the time. I was oh. like, what? I was like, so Carol says it is so authentic that everyone on the set is going to think that I'm your beard, that I'm basically not even, you know, <laughs> that, I, I, that I'm not, str- that, that he's going, everyone's going to think that he's gay in real life yeah. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. because that's how good it was. And she refused. She told him, I'm, you know, I'm going to divorce you if you continue to do this. And, and he So was like, did he meet Carol at Home Depot? I'm just met- <laughs> And, or, and, and are we talking about uh, Dr. Carol Marcus, portrayed by B.B. Besh? No. <laughs> no. Darn. Not that but Carol. But listen, no. I, know, I, know that, I know that your boy Robbie is a theater queen, because I watched that Voyager reunion special a few months yes. ago, and yeah. there's a clip of him doing, is it Into the Woods? Into the, Into woods. the woods, yeah. Get out of here. Theater queen. Can theater he sing? Queen. Yeah. Yeah. Get yeah. out of here. Yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's Tim huge... Russ can sing too. <gasps> Tim Russ, Tim sing. Russ yeah. sealed it, yo. Yeah. With that, yeah. that number from Dreamgirls? I think he sang something it, from Pippin, if I'm Was it right. Pippin? I thought it was, it was Dreamgirls. Join us. Da, da, oh, was it Pippin? Da, 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 da. Yeah. There's a lot of talent on the Voyager cast. There really Fabulous. is. Um, yes. Well, I found out that that uh, Roxanne uh, Dawson? Dawson was in a chorus, in chorus line. line. Yeah. She played my favorite character, Diana yeah. Morales. Oh, yeah. No, she killed and, it in chorus and line. I, wow. and, and then in, in that special, she says that she they brought her back to do the last six performances of a chorus line in its original Broadway run. And I mm-hmm. saw the third to the last performance of uh, a chorus line. So I saw her as no, Diana Morales. You didn't know it really? Her. Yeah, but I didn't realize oh. that it was her because it was before Voyager. Oh my God. Like, oh my God. That is amazing. Yeah. I'm going to tell her that. That's cool. But she was oh, awesome. Yeah. She's good. Mm-hmm. She's good. Yeah, we were all kind of scared of her, though. We were, me and Roxanne, because she, <laughs> her character being the half Klingon. Klingon, right. yeah. Yeah, we, we kind of just, we, I don't know. It was just really And weird. she directs now. She, she, directs, directs, yeah, she I, I I had a brief, brief teeny tiny exchange with her uh, when the Trek 50 year thing at the Javits Center and I was covering it for something I don't remember now. Mm-hmm. And uh, she was directing, she had directed an episode of The Deuce on HBO, just talking about The Deuce. And I said, so it was kind of like Riza. And she, you know, got a very like kind of stern vibe. And she was like, well, if you think of Times Square as a pleasure planet, like the inference being that like these sex workers were not having a good time. And I was like, oh my God, I think I just like. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, did yeah. you notice I was probably one of the only Trek actors not at the Javits Center for that uh, big thing? You know? Yes, and may I ask why? Because I, I serve as the Trek Trek director for Dragon Con and the, oh. the company that threw out the, uh, th- put that event on that same day as Dragon Con was stupid. I mean, I just, that really pissed me off. It's like, there should be a rule. There should be a governing committee that governs all conventions. And if mm-hmm. you are an East Coast convention and you're a big convention, you put it on the same day. It was the same as, day. It was like Labor Day Dragon weekend. Con. No, yeah, you just don't do that. Dragon Con has been on Labor Day weekend for 20 years. You don't, yeah. you know, and then, in comes you know the Javits event, and it's like, okay, well, we're gonna put it on the same day. It's like, why don't you pick any other weekend? Because the three big conventions in the East Coast are going to be Toronto, Toronto, uh, the big Toronto convention, uh, yep. New York Comic Con, um, who is also the same company that put on mm. the, the special Trek event, and then Dragon Con. That's it. Okay, oh, wow. just stay away from the this. The two other companies, each company has to sh- sh- stay away from two other companies' dates. That's it. Right. You know what I'm saying? And if you've yeah. established yourself as Labor Day weekend and, this, right. and another company puts it on Labor Day, they should be fined. Like this governing committee should say, okay, that's fine. You can have it the same weekend, but we're going to have to fine you $500,000, half a million for that. You know? Also, and then it's not like, the fans. The fans no. want to go to multiple events. Right. You're going to no? cut into each other's you know, uh, attendance. Of course. Of mm-hmm. course. Yeah. So I was asked. I was asked by somebody to come do that event and they're like oh they got it they're gonna pay you a great this and that i go you do understand i am the trek trek director i cannot you know and because of that i couldn't get anybody to for my own trek Mm. trek you know my own trek programming i'm sitting here i literally scrounged two people i got aaron eisenberg who was not invited to the the javits center and then i got um uh alexander sadig so uh he he flew oh, over dr from dr bashir, dr. bashir. No. yeah i got dr bashir and i got no. No. And, no. I, and i i was so happy that i at least had them because it was it was slim pickings everyone them was gone so. <laughs> yeah. wow well you got two good ones i did get two great yeah. ones yeah their, their panel was was uh it was the highlight of that convention the the, the nog bashir panel was great yes oh i do love me some julian too 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. He's look at that guy's career. Good Lord. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's done so many roles and so many projects and such a, such a class act. The only thing I'm bummed about is I wish he kept his, his birth name. I wish he didn't change it, you know, because he was Sadiq El Fadil and then mm-hmm. he went to Alexander Sadiq. And that's partially because living in the United States of America, let's right. face it, the only other ethnic group that gets more crap than Asian American men or Asian Americans, I think, is going to be Middle Eastern Americans, right? Mm-hmm. Arab Americans. Mm-hmm. They have literally been at the bottom of the barrel in terms of respect and, and whatnot in this country because of Gulf War and everything that's been happening, right. you know? And so that, I'm sure, was one of the things that kind of contributed to that name change because why would you yeah. change your birth name you know i mean i i ever since i started watching rami there's the show about the egyptian american family yeah. if any of you have oh, not seen so that good. please watch it what's yeah. the name of it? it rami um rami. and it's it it kicks ass and his really, best friend is the best yes it is but it's the first portrayal antonio of a arab american family that is not about terrorism that's not yeah. about like these people are infidels you know i mean it's not about that it's all about a family and it's the first time you see them painted in a three-dimensional full mm. representation of who they are and because of that i sit there and go god damn it alexander sadiq you change your name right back to sadiq <laughs> you should go right back to the original name because mm. you're really proud and head. you know, that's one of the beautiful things about Trek is that in the future, according to Trek, mm-hmm. prejudice and racism, it's not eliminated. Poverty. Right. But uh, it's right. Money, right. it's all eliminated. More diversity, less prejudice. Mm-hmm. And you see, like, I, I don't know if you watch Discovery, but I love that there's this character, Linus. I don't know what kind of alien he is. We were watching Discovery the other day and Linus is the reptilian. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and yeah. then Megan goes... That's Paris and Janeway's baby grown up. <gasps> yes. Ooh. That's the salamander grown up. <laughs> That's the yes. yes. Linus yep. is really what Paris is... and Janeway's kid. They and just so I started them. laughing my ass off. Like if you remember, those three babies oh. were abandoned, oh, right? They, yeah. Nobody, yeah. nobody looked after the them. Water. They like, went right in the water. That could easily yeah. be Linus, okay? Because right. human that DNA. So perfect. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Couldn't they have transport? Well, that's a whole. That's other amazing. Thing. Yeah. But oh, Trek shit. is as 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 versatile and as varied as Trek has been, which is a godsend. There's still so many different ethnic groups that haven't been represented. You know what I'm saying? In, yeah. um, there's why you know there needs to be a there needs to be a Filipino ensign or someone who speaks with a really heavy Tagalog accent on uh, Voyager, you know, <laughs> or something like that. Could, there's a lot of different groups that could be still yeah. represented. But just speaking as, a, as a, a member of the LGBTQI community, I will say that, that Discovery is really pushing the boundary with gender non-binary characters, oh my gosh. And transgender oh my characters. Gosh. And oh, that's yeah. really lovely to see. You know, I remember uh, on uh, STNG, they had the androgynous sex episode which was clearly that. trying to run parallels uh, uh for gay people and i was yeah. like not good enough and yeah. then on uh ds9 terry farrell's uh ex came back but was a woman right and they kind of still were in love but i was yep. still like not good enough no <laughs> so there no. so although that was a lovely episode so they're they're you know they really are making strides it is yeah. lovely well, so when you watch Discovery, Antonio, are you like, good enough? Do you say that now? I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> we're getting there. Almost good enough. With, Almost there. With Samuel and Culver, more. with Anthony Rapp and Wilson Cruz? Yes, yes. I like the idea behind it, but it's also, you know, why you gotta be two bottoms? Big oh, time. Oh, Thank you. But they what? both can sing. Honey, you know the show tunes in that ready room? Hello. Okay. okay. So, but, but getting still, back to timeless. Yes, let's go back. <laughs> <laughs> let's just talk about Colbert from now on. Forget about timeless. Okay. <laughs> so they devise a plan to take the frequency they got from Seven's severed head. That's what's happening. They figure what they can do is Kim can figure out the proper course corrections, which is the mistake that he made the first time around. So right. he spent 15 years analyzing the mistake, right. and he now knows you know, I can send these corrections back and Voyager will be fine. Right. So they figure, okay, we've got to send this back and we have to send it at the right time because I, I love the doctor's line where he's like, can't we just call the past again? It's not going anywhere <laughs> because yeah. he tries it and nothing happens. Yeah. And it right. turns out 
he was wrong again. Again, yeah. And Which then that's when Garrett like, has his blow up. It's yeah. so amazing. I destroyed Voyager once and I'm doing it again. Well, right. because you know, you, if you think about that, that you, you killed all your friends. You spent 15 years finding the right phase correction numbers to send back. And then it's the wrong ones. They still don't work. And you're like, what? So yeah, <laughs> that's the ultimate don't moment. Right there. It's, it's like, do like, don't, don't. It's a double dough. Don't, don't. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the, the doctor gets, you know, Ensign Kim back together. Slaps him. Meanwhile, they are being chased by the challenger. Captain Jordy LaForge is like, I'm going to blow you up if I have to. Yeah. And uh, so mm. they do something where now they have damaged their warp core. The, the Delta Flyer has damaged its warp core. It's going to blow up. This is it. It is yep. the last chance. And they, uh, Ensign Kim figures out that if he sends a message back uh, with coordinates that will release them from the slipstream, then right. that should do it. Yeah. And just within the very nick of time, as the yeah. ship is blowing up, he sends that message back. Vo yeah. A Voyager flies out of the slipstream. And well, I thought it was. It, I thought it was to shut it off entirely, so it didn't even activate. Isn't, isn't... And Janeway's like, shut it down, close the rift. The, the the corrections were to uh, safely kick Voyager out, out of, of the slipstream. It. Okay, so the, yeah. we're already in the slipstream a little bit then. Is yeah, that, right. Yeah. Okay. and in fact, they were even just in that short time in the slipstream brings them ten full years closer to right. Home. Right. And, right. And right. remember, uh, with the uh, with the twenty years that Kess threw them forward, that's thirty years saved in this voyage. Right. Like right. now, like now, they right. actually have a chance of getting home, and all yeah. of them still being alive. Mm. Yeah. So it's still a win. It's yes, still right. a win. Correct. And Harry is able to get a message back mm -hmm. to Harry. And in a beautiful scene in the um, in the the lunchroom, the, uh, mess. the mess in the mess hall, um, Harry's there diligently trying to figure out what went wrong. And the the captain just kind of like in this beautiful, like beautific mood, like just like lovingly gives Harry this message yeah. and this sweet smile and, you know, and kind of lets him know that he was the ship's protector. Right. It's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's really tender and really, yeah. I mean, I was so emotional. Yeah. And then Harry has his talk with Harry and tells him, hey, dude, you owe me one. I saved it for you. And you yeah. go back to Harry and you, Garrett, you look so young. You look really <laughs> young. And your eyes are just watering, but you're holding it back. That's about yeah. to cry, but not crying. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I just like, yeah. uh, I, I just thought it was beautiful. It's a gorgeous way to end the episode. Mm. Yeah, it was. It even when I watch it now, I still, I still get, I still tear up at that moment. It's, it's one of those, yeah. time, those things that it doesn't matter how many times you watch it, it you still, you still Aww. get the feels, you know. And yeah. I definitely, I definitely had it there. And and they were really kind of, you know, they didn't want to see a lot of tears from any of us, so it was tough to to let that stuff kind of happen, you know. Um, like I can definitely say that that episode, I was able to have a little bit of emotion um, when Species Eight Four Seven Two knocks the bejesus out of me, and I'm lying on that that bio bed. Um, um, is that, that one tear? Know. Yeah, that, that one down. tear that came out because Jane was standing there. She's like, you know, you fight this, Harry, and I and I said, okay, I'm gonna let the one tear fall, and it came. Let out. I happen. thought that was good. I thought that worked there too. Now, did, um, did you so, ash that tear out, or was it like glycerin or CGI, or did you actually? No, cry? that's acted. That was that's acted. Wow. Yeah, that's acting. Yeah, acting. Ne I have never seen. And then you know, I I did so. The tears of so that tear definitely was authentic. The one the, the welling up of uh, tears in in timeless is authentic, and also I had tears in the final episode of getting back home, and those were tears of joy, which is different, yeah. you know. Which is I've never acted that before, and I tried to pull it out, and I I found it. I found that place where I went, and I found the tears of joy, which was really difficult to. Unfortunately, they didn't. They put that reaction at a different time, though. Um, they the the reaction on the bridge of you're welcome home, Captain Janeway, and they have a. Uh, close-ups of everyone they didn't use that take they moved that take to after when when picardo goes mr paris congratulations you have a you're a father of bouncing baby whatever so they cut to me with the tear with tears welling up oh. about, about the stupid baby like i don't care about paris's <laughs> oh, kid but you're happy you his best friend you're happy no, for your i am happy for getting home I, those are tears of joy for home not for someone's baby i right. could care less about your offspring right now okay <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm like, like, 
you were afraid the baby was outranking you. That's right. <laughs> no, no, those would be Four tears of pain, ten. though. Those are painful tears. No, I don't. <laughs> and so the this hundred baby episode you. concludes with Voyager ten years closer to home. Yeah. 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 Back in sync with whatever timeline they were supposed to be in sync with. Yeah. Yeah. Seven's head is attached to her body. Harry has lost that crunchy ass salty wig. <laughs> and all is right in the universe. Of course, Eyebrow Lady is off doing her, her yeah. eyebrow thing. I have a question about the 100th Tessa, episode. Tessa thing. becomes a doble girl on Risa. It yes. really goes bad for her. It goes so south for Tessa, unfortunately. Did, but. did you guys have like a 100th episode cake? Is that like a, a thing yeah, they do on there's shows? A photo, there's a photo that I printed up of that, that that sort of has circulated around 100th episode cake. And I think awesome. it was white frosting with some blue trim and the big 100 block on there. And, and then um, in that show, shot it's all of us but the funny thing is i every time i see this picture i tell uh, if i'm autograph uh, autographing this photo i keep telling the fans okay this is what you you can know about this photo everyone is who's wearing starfleet uniform that shows who works all the time and the people that are in street oh. clothes they're the ones that are lucky you know and it, and you can see you know that, that some of the actors are, are definitely not wearing their uniforms and they're not the bridge crew right the bridge yeah, crew right. were there all the time so i like looking. someone that then like ayala you know lieutenant ayala yes yes it's yeah. ayala <laughs> oh, well, I see a lieutenant. He's a re oh, he's another recurring theme on Fire Chicote. Yes, we, we crush on Ensign Ayala. We do. I yes. just interviewed L Lieutenant Ayala. I just I just interviewed him for my podcast. Yeah. How he doing? Yeah. He's, What's that? He's all right. How he doing? He okay? He's doing good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's doing good. Yeah. He's a he's a lacrosse he's a lacrosse coach for a, a wow. lacrosse team. Mm. Yeah. Oh, so he must have he a nice lacrosse legs, me. Honey. Yeah, he, he got nice legs. He, uh, he he's uh he's definitely uh, doing good and uh, yeah. He was in a lot of stuff, man. He's referred to all the time. You, see, you tell him I said, how he doing? I'll do that. Yeah. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. So before we close out this absolutely wonderful episode, I want to say, Garrett, thank you so much thank for being a part so of this. Much. Oh, thank you're welcome. You. You're welcome. It was awesome. I, I had one more thing to say, though. I, I did it for me, that whole thing about the, you know, everything, the ship's going to, the shuttle's going to blow up in Timeless. Uh, we have one last chance. That was so reminiscent of Non Sequitur, the episode with Harry back in, because the shuttle also was going to blow up there with Tom Paris in there. Remember the, the, the mm -hmm. rebel Tom Paris mm -hmm. that was kind of gruff yeah. and everything? Yeah. So it was another whole thing. Like if, if you don't get the right uh, calculation right now, everything right. is done for, right? So, they have, well, they it was always some kind of anomalous occurrence or some kind of space creature or some kind of space radiation. Yeah. There's a supercut yeah. of the of the cast saying, Captain, it's it's some, some kind, kind of, of yes. Yeah, right. Sort of, there's there's kind quite of. a bit of it. Sometimes you, you hear it several times in an episode. Right. You do. Right. You really do. Right. You really do. Neelix is but some yeah. kind of squirrel bitch. Yes. <laughs> Neelix alone. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to come for Neelix. Dan, can you tell us about the Wrath of Vegas? Yes. Space yes. Weekend. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, also, I just have to say, Garrett, this is what I go through when I join these guys. It is basically <laughs> me laughing because <laughs> it's just, I love these guys. Oh, it's been fun. I, I love being on this. Uh, it's been fun. I love it. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, what we're planning is uh, this episode is going to be uh, the featured event for Virtual Wrath of Vegas 2020. So uh, hopefully awesome. everybody is watching this on Friday night, December the 4th. Um, we're gonna do three days, uh, the 4th, 5th, and 6th, and there's going to be some more Trekkie feud. There's gonna be a uh, three, kind of like a three episode tournament of Trekkie Jeopardy. Nice. Uh, wow. we're have a lot of our celebrity pals coming back in to talk. We've got a lot of musical stuff that's planned. Um, I'm hoping Voltaire will uh, join us again, who is amazing. Um, yeah, so lots of, uh, lots of stuff happening. And when we plan, as we were beginning to plan, and I thought, you know what? I need some more fire Chakotay in my life. And uh, I need them to invite me back. So I said, hey guys, if I get Garrett, can I come back again too? And they were like, okay, okay. Yo, so, sure. Uh, so, you know, uh, here we are with the 100th episode. Um, Dan Devi, are you using me as your all access pass to fire Chakotay? What <laughs> He's the heck? He's pimping you out. He pimped, he pimped you out, Garrett. He pimped you out. 
He yeah. pimped you out lovely. Oh. <laughs> and if people want to find out about gays in space, they can go to gaysinspace.org, three A's in gays, three A's in space. You got it. Yep. And Garrett, if people want to check out the Delta Flyer podcast that you do with my future ex-husband, how can they do that? <laughs> uh, they can go to the deltaflyers.org. So the deltaflyers.org. Make sure you put the S at the very it's end. It's plural. Yeah, I'm sorry. Plural. I could, I'll, I'll, I'll edit in a s sound later. Thank you. You know, which I do a lot because I'm so displeased with so many things that Matinga says. I just randomly edit in. S. S. Well, you, you, you do have that very sibilant S because you're a big Mary. <laughs> Okay, well, you've been listening to Fire to Cote, this very special episode. Thanks again to our special guests, Garrett Wong and Dan Devi. I am Mike Diamond. This is Ms. Batinga. And this is Booby. Thank you guys so much. Thank yes, you. Thank you so thank much. You thank you. Booby, you're reminding me LL Cool J all over again right now. I'm cool just looking at you. Yeah, there's a little <laughs> LL Cool J going on. Yes. <laughs> Oh, you do have that, that all the cool time. You do no. have Doesn't that he? energy. No, yeah. he, no but just, I'm baby. just saying. Go ahead, baby. Oh, look at the facial structure. I mean, do you guys not see this? I'm, I'm totally looking at that. The, yep. For a um, second, when I came on, Mike, I thought you had LL Cool J on this <laughs> Zoom call. I was like, good Lord, he's here. Here. He's, he's here. here. Another star. We, you know, we, we call Boo the goat, not because he's the greatest of all time, because he'll occasionally eat a paper bag. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, but it, it's, it, he does have that similarity to LL. He does. Yeah.